I think it was very evident that bad things can happen to good people. Tonight, Dwayne Owen on death row, taking his final breath. Nobody felt safe in Delray anymore. We were all scared. Who was this monster that did this? The bone-chilling crimes decades ago, shaking South Florida to its core. It was a locked all the time. Every time I hear a little bit of a noise outside, I'm up. A 14-year-old babysitter murdered. We knew at 11 o'clock that Karen had spoken to my mom. And she's dead. Karen's dead. The killer prowling the streets, about to strike again. I was the last one to see her. Georgia was killed during one of our visits to Florida. He would have killed again, no doubt. This is where you all got him. Is he aware of his actions? There's an awareness. It is a different awareness than what we have. Now, a painful chapter ending. Because it's been something that has been sitting with our family for almost 40 years. Is this what the family wants to happen? Yes, without a doubt. Tonight, the execution of one of Palm Beach County's most notorious killers. He looked into my sister's eyes when she died. And I will look into his eyes when he dies. Good evening. I'm Ashley Glass. And I'm Jay Cashmere. You may not know their names, but their stories have haunted South Florida for decades. Karen Slattery and Georgiana Warden, both killed by the same man in 1984. Earlier tonight, that man was put to death some 40 years after his horrific crimes. Karen was just 14 years old with her whole life ahead of her. She was killed while babysitting two young girls here in Delray Beach. Two months later, Georgiana Warden, or Georgia as her family calls her, murdered in her home in Boca Raton, her children fast asleep in the other room. Both attacks separate and unprovoked. Now, nearly four decades later, those who studied and worked the case are speaking out. They say they may never know exactly why the brutal attacks happened, but they do believe lives were saved the day the killer was taken off the streets. One investigator I spoke with called him, quote, the beginning of a serial killer. Tonight, we are remembering the victims, hearing from those who knew and loved them best. Each one sharing their own stories, and as you will soon hear, Tonight isn't about closure or justice. Nothing will bring Karen or Georgia back. And although many years have passed, there is one big question family and friends say they will never get the answer to. Every community has a crime, one case that tears at its very fabric. We don't have monsters like that living in our community. In Delray Beach and Boca Raton, those worst fears were once tied to one man. Dwayne Owen. Yeah, you, you only run into a guy like him, thank God, but you only run into somebody like him maybe once in a lifetime. So much has changed over the years. Delray was tiny. It was a tiny little sleepy beach town. And, you know, these are things that happen in big cities, not in little towns like ours. And it really did, really did just rock our world. In 1984, the quiet coastal communities were in many ways untouched from sprawling development and surging populations. But the communities would be changed by two mysterious attacks. Saw the, you know, the news and, you know, it just blew me away, you know. Um, that, you know, nothing like that had ever happened in Boca. You know, that was a big deal. It was at a home on a quiet cul-de-sac here in Delray Beach when Karen's young life brutally ended. A quiet March Saturday night babysitting two young children shattered by a late night intruder. They say he broke into the Delray house where she was babysitting last March. A killer who stabbed the 14-year-old 18 times, attacking her first in the kitchen before dragging her into a bedroom and raping her while the two young children she babysat slept in another room, 
possibly unaware of the horror inside the home. No homicide is routine, but this one was just so uh, compelling with regard to uh, the victim, her age, uh, uh, the manner of death, the cause of death, all those things combined. It was uh, certainly would qualify for heinous crime. Delray Beach Lieutenant Rick Lincoln was assigned the case in its earliest stages, one unlike any other in his career. It was just really um, important to try and keep everybody um, focused on the task at hand because it was very easy to get overwhelmed by the enormity of the uh, um, the horror. It's not just a case, but a young life that doesn't fade away after 39 years. Is there just one thing that if this case, you know, wakes you up at night, this is the thing that just really sticks for you? Yes. When I read the, the files and found that Karen Slattery had been killed maybe seconds after hanging up the phone with her mother, who of course was calling to check on her and make sure that everything was all right. And as a parent, you think, okay, it was, I think it was about 10 o'clock. The, the couple, you know, they'll be home soon. They'll bring, they'll bring Karen home and, and, and that's it. And then you realize what happened after that. For years, the case captivated journalist Randy Schultz. So much of his life's work has been devoted to telling the stories of this community. This one stood out. The Slattery case was so random, so horrible, created such panic that I guess kind of like the investigators, there, there are just stories that you don't really forget. Word of Karen's killing spreading through her high school. What can you still not make sense of? Why? 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 Why would he do this? Why would he, why, why did he choose her? Why did he choose that house? Why? That's the why. Why? How could you, you know, have so much evil in your heart that you would do this to another human being, to a child? Do you think that's an answer you will ever get? Yeah, it just it just was awful. It was an awful feeling. Um, you know, I, I remember that in my gut. You know, and and uh, the horrific way that he committed this. This is where Karen Slattery is forever laid to rest, right next to her father. Boynton Beach's cemetery and Memorial Park. Her loved ones tell me they gather here, sometimes as a group or all alone, to think about Karen, her life, and what she meant to each of them. My mom would go to the cemetery pretty much daily and she would go visit my dad and my sister. We were a typical family. It was my mom and my dad. I had an older brother. I had Karen. What was she like as an older sister? I'm sure I was just the annoying sister. <laughs> I'm sure I was. Everything she did, I had to do. Everything. She did gymnastics, I had to do gymnastics. Uh, she did cheerleading, I had to do cheerleading. Um, she dove in high school I had to go dive she was she did a lot of stuff with her friends she was she was a teenager she was a teenager and she babysat that was her thing she babysat she French braided and she cheered and you know she was only a freshman in high school she was young she was 14 there's a bunch of us in there and Karen's right up front Karen was by far so popular just everybody loved her and um, wanted to be around her. And was Karen your best friend? She was. We were really close, um, honestly, more in grade school. Spunky, fiery girl that I grew up with. What was it that made your bond with Karen so special? We were more like sisters, I feel. Um, I, I was very at, at their house often. We would laugh a lot together. Uh, we loved to go shopping and one great memory I have was we went shopping for her birthday one year and just laughing. Remember her, you know, in the halls and you know her face is really unmistakable you know smiling yeah happy very happy kid 
When you picture her face, what do you, what do you picture? Sweet, just a sweet, innocent. You know, she was just starting high school and kind, vivacious, she was cheerleader, adorable, cutest, she was cheerleader, um, dressed really preppy, she had the cutest clothes, cutest accessories, just nicest person you could ever meet. As you just heard from Karen's sister, Karen loved to babysit. She also tells me for months after the murder, no one would babysit in Delray Beach as the fear really set in. It was months and months that people were afraid, you know, about this. Panic and frustration as weeks go by with no arrests. Ahead, how the killer was able to hide in plain sight for so long. Bad things can happen to good people. March 24th, 1984, the day the innocence of childhood was ripped away from Debbie Johnson. So much of her life is tough to put into focus before that day, the day her older sister was taken from her. What was she like as an older sister? I wish I could tell you. That's where it's, it gets hard because it's been 39 years. And my memory, it's just, unfortunately, I, I have very little memories of her. My sister's wearing a Highlands Inn shirt. What remains in focus? A lot of these photos are hard to go through. The hours before Karen's death, two young sisters continuing a family tradition, never suspecting it would be the last. We went Easter dress shopping because we always, always got new dresses for Easter. And we each got our dresses. And um, I remember when we got home, my mom was like, don't tell your dad. That, that's like probably the last good memory that I, that I have was us going shopping. This was on the day of her death. Yeah. And in fact, for her funeral, I wore my Easter dress. Because that's what I wanted to wear. You know, we got the shoes that went with it and then we had our Easter bonnets because that's what you wore at church. The shock and horror of this slattery attack gained the case national attention, and with that came possible distractions. Delray Beach was not um, without violent crime, but we have never, ever seen anything quite like this one. And murdered 14-year-old Karen Slattery. Immediately, detectives started interviewing people who knew the victims, from family members to friends. Ruling out those closest to them, it quickly became apparent they were dealing with a stranger, one who seemingly left only a footprint behind, making the search all the more difficult. It's just, it's hard to tell people, going back so far, the, the sense of panic that followed the Slattery murder. I mean, it happened in a, on a quiet street in a you know very upscale oceanfront neighborhood in Delray Beach for I me mean, for weeks if you were in Delray Beach and you wanted a teenage girl to babysit mm -mm, no thank you that was not going to happen so the sense of relief when it became clear that the killer in both cases was in jail was palpable but I think the effects lingered for many weeks and months after that. Months and months that people were afraid, you know, about this. And it took a long time, you know, for things to settle down. Tragically, with the search for Karen's killer weighing on families, the next discovery would create unimaginable shockwaves beyond Delray Beach into neighboring Boca Raton. Ahead, a killer strikes again. How did he get in? Which window did he go in? The, the last window you see on the west side of the house? 
A single mother of two brutally killed while her young children were fast asleep. The terrorizing nature of her death that still haunts investigators decades later. Bad things can happen to good people. Every time I hear a little bit of a noise outside, I'm up. May 29, 1984, will forever be etched in the mind of Sergeant Kevin McCoy. You see this house and look at it now today, a lot of tough memories come back. Oh, sure. It was not necessary. Georgiana Warden's crime scene shook Boca Raton with the horrific, brutal, and terrorizing nature of her death. She never had her fingerprints taken. She was beaten so bad, former Boca Raton Police Sergeant Kevin McCoy recalls having to prove circumstantially who she was. She'd never been arrested, Georgiana. Mm -hmm. Never was arrested. Uh, no traffic offenses, no nothing. Uh, couldn't, couldn't, couldn't find any dental records on her. Georgiana had been fast asleep that Tuesday night while her two children, ages 13 and 9, slept in a front bedroom. The calm of the night shattered when a prowler lurking around the home before breaking in would ultimately murder Warden with a hammer. How did he get in? Which window did he go in? Well, at the side of the house uh, is where her bedroom is, and he could look through the window and saw her there. And so he was intent on getting in. Georgia Warden now rests here, a cemetery in Boca Raton. When she was with us, she was many things to many people. An instructor at Boca Raton College, now Lynn University. But her most important role, mother. Her two daughters, Stephanie and Kara, now grown, living out of state, they visit here sometimes. Georgia's loved ones say a lot of her identity and purpose was wrapped up in her children. And like any mother can relate, wanting the very best for them. She had plenty of struggle worked two jobs as a single mom to, to raise and, and protect her two daughters, right? And so um, just her dedication to her daughters. Trevor Stanick, who always lived up north, away from his Florida relatives, says to really know his Aunt Georgia is to know this. Georgia was an exceptionally hard worker who really loved her family. How do you remember feeling when you were around your Aunt Georgia? I remember it as as special time, right? It was it was something that we didn't get to do a lot that that I looked forward to. I recall her as loving and and I recall her as engaging. She was a she was a small woman. She was barely five feet tall, and um, Kara described her as you know, small body, small face, huge smile all the time. Um, and that was also something that resonated with, with my mom. Um, just how Georgia was one of the most fun people that my mom has ever had the, the opportunity to be around. She loved to spend time with her. I think one of the last things I do remember is we all went to Disney World and it was a really big thing. Was Georgiana your best friend? Yes, yes she was. We spoke every day on the phone. We were very close. We were both divorced at the time, so and we uh, we had children, and so there was always something in commonality that we always were t discussing every day. Tell me more about what made your friendship so special. I think it was um, her personality. You know, she had a lot of love, and her personality was, if you saw her, she had a smile that just went from ear to ear. People knew her, and they would just fall in love with her. She was a pistol. She was a pistol. I'm, I'm telling you, nothing got past her by any means. And she was very uh, sharp, I mean, very intelligent, and a very um, upbeat person, always upbeat. And I think that was one of her best qualities. And I'm just very thankful that we did have the time together. Georgia's best friend tells me their daily phone calls often focused on their children. Her nephew says if there was one thing he could tell his Aunt Georgia about how her daughter's lives have turned out, it's that she'd be very proud of them. But he thought he was smart. He 
he thought uh, he wouldn't make mistakes. A head. Could two evil acts possibly be tied to one man? More eerie similarities emerged that finally led to a break in the case. Bad things can happen to good people. As Georgia Warden's family struggled with her sudden and violent death in her own home, Police in the spring of 1984 were facing a new reality. There were now two murders within weeks apart, within miles of each other. Two brutal attacks against women and two murder weapons. One a knife, the other a hammer. And we would sit down and go over the slattery homicide and then Warden's homicide, and that's where we came up with all these similarities. The evidence was undeniable. That was a big, a big factor was the fact that it, it was almost some of you have a female victim and you have her two children that were left alone, not, not harmed at all. You know, uh, Karen was, uh, she was uh, babysitting the two kids and they were in bed when it happened. Both victims sexually assaulted. There had been a lot of homicide cases in Palm Beach County over the years, but this one got a lot of attention. And perhaps it was because of the manner of the accusation, the homicide, and then the sexual assault. Longtime Palm Beach County defense attorney Michael Sounick was early on in his legal career, but realized the heightened attention each case would bring. And the atmosphere, and I guess from a law enforcement perspective, was, you know, we're going to get this guy. Resources of two police departments, Boca Raton and Delray Beach, joined as one. A footprint at the Slattery crime scene and a fingerprint at Georgia Warden's home proved to be critical clues left behind in the dead of night. He thought he was smart, and he thought uh, he wouldn't make mistakes. Dwayne Owen hadn't initially emerged as a person of interest. In fact, it wasn't until after he exposed himself to a student at Florida Atlantic University that he became a prime suspect. The student gave police a description of a man with a short military style haircut. Now armed with a suspect sketch, as seen here in the Miami Herald, McCoy used the image against pictures of known burglary suspects. I picked that one out and said, here, this guy's close, let's hit, put him in a lineup. And as soon as we put him in the lineup and started showing him, it was like, yeah, that's him, that's him, that's him. Immediately, he started going through the evidence, and one thing became more apparent. He was active in the area within a few blocks of where the homicide was. He lived not too, not too far from the homicide on the other side of the tracks. Uh, so we just started compiling this. and. Uh, like I said to you before, we, we just couldn't eliminate him. Put him there at the scene of the homicide. Soon thereafter, Rick Lincoln entered the picture with the Karen Slattery murder case and the mountain of evidence along with it. We were fairly comfortable and confident that uh, Owen was good for Georgina Ward and he was also going to be good for Karen Slattery based on the case similarities. Now they needed to find Owen to build a case and catching him came by chance. Not long after a be on the lookout message went out, Boca police spotted Owen riding his bicycle. This is where you all got him. Right. He was stopped just a few blocks from the warden crime scene. We immediately came up here. He was there, Sergeant Kevin McCoy stared into the eyes of a man who would soon encapsulate the most significant, substantial, and far-reaching case he would ever investigate. When you made eye contact with him right here on May 30th of that day, what went through your mind when you saw him? That he's, I'm glad he's off the street. Uh, didn't really say too much. Uh, we cuffed him up, put him in the car, and took him down to Boca PD. We're glad we brought this to a conclusion. Owen was a self-admitted prowler, according to Sergeant McCoy. He didn't have a car, so he used a bike to get around town. He lived with his brother from time to time, but was described as antisocial and kept to himself. Those who knew him closest in court recall a mild-mannered man who was easy to relate to including his former defense attorney, Michael Sounick. In terms of him as a person, I found him easy to talk to. One of the things that I do remember about him is that he was very soft-spoken. Um, he wasn't super aggressive. But the nature of his crimes painted a picture of a monster who lurked and loitered. He was the beginning, in my opinion, of, of a serial killer because you just don't pick out people like that. And when you talk to him, uh, he described what he would do when he went out to talk to, uh, he called it, he was going out on maneuvers. Conversations with Owen left McCoy with a keen insight. Always face on that desk and, you know, shoot, you know, my stats pulled up and I think, 
think she kind of Kind of he was a he was a prowler, uh, no relation to any of the victims. Was prowling the neighborhoods, uh, looking into windows, so on and so forth. Uh, and he would have killed again, no no doubt. Inside the mind of a killer. When we scar children. We have to expect there's going to be outcomes that can lead to tragedies. From abused child to monster on death row, just who is Dwayne Owen? Bad things can happen to good people. Just who is Dwayne Owen? A man who's been on death row for decades and in recent weeks on death watch. Gary Howitt has been one of the closest people in Owen's life. She defended him in court for decades and stayed in contact with him over the years by mail, phone calls and visits. Dwayne is a very complicated man. I've now known him for 30 years some very severe mental illness. Um, I think probably as a result of his background that is one of the most traumatic and really heartbreaking backgrounds as a child and growing up that I've ever seen. Howard paints a very different picture of the monster many say carried out these brutal attacks. Is he aware of his actions? and what he did. He is, I would say, there's an awareness. It is a different awareness than what we have. From the moment Howard began researching his troubled upbringing, she saw brutality. It started at birth and was detailed by a childhood neighbor. Could you describe for the jury what, what that household was like when you first went into it? It was filthy. It was filthy. All kinds of liquor bottles. Uh, no food in the refrigerator whatsoever. There was routine physical and sexual abuse in the home. Um, he witnessed his mother being raped on a regular basis. Um, he had a half-brother who was locked in the basement by his father. Additionally, Howard says Owen watched his mother die a slow and agonizing death from cancer when he was nine. His father also ended his life in the family garage when Duane was 13. They found him in the car in which he killed himself in, in the garage. But out of their fear of being taken away and separated from each other, they left him there for several days. Duane spent his teenage years in an orphanage in Eden Rapids, Michigan. A fellow orphan recalled at trial the abuse that occurred there. I think we all accepted bad things were going to happen to us, and there was nothing we could do to stop it. Howard says the abuse was both physical and sexual. She says Dwayne's brother ran away from the orphanage to Palm Beach County, and Dwayne followed. She said his upbringing and mental state would be used by his lawyers to try and spare his life. Documents showed the court gave some weight to it. But ultimately deciding Owen was, quote, not so sick that he was unable to become mean, calculating, cruel, and evil. A wicked person who now deserved to die. Dwayne, just like everyone, is much more than the worst things he ever did. And it doesn't change the worst things he ever did, but it would be simplistic to say that's who he is. He is so much more. Obviously, I'm very troubled by what he did. I was at the time. I continue to be. I have great, great sympathy for the victims and the survivors and the families. Um, you can't feel for one side without feeling for the other side, right? Why it took 40 years. The officers in Delray were experienced, aggressive officers. Uh, they wanted a confession. Coming up, Owen speaks up conversations that would ultimately end up in the Florida Supreme Court. Bad things can happen to good people. May 30th, 1984. With Dwayne Owen now in police custody, it didn't take long for the suspected killer to start talking. Police quickly learned Owen enjoyed playing a part in solving crimes he ultimately committed. Owen kind of impressed you as someone that 
if you basically could convince him that you had the goods on him, he was going to give it up because he was proud to talk about his work. That's, that's really what it boiled down to. It was like once he knew you had him pretty good, he gave it up. Police say Owen bragged about taking law enforcement classes at one point in time. They referred to him as playing a cat and mouse game, talking in third person, weighing his options on whether to talk or not, and providing information that would incriminate himself. And eventually he went down, you know, through certain other aspects of the crime that only he would know. From talking to him and the questions he asked me, uh, uh, like I told Rick Lincoln, I says, I think this is our boy. The breakthrough came on June 21st, 1984. Owen confessed to the murder of Georgia Warden, according to McCoy. He would then confess again, this time for the killing of Karen Slattery. So, this, you know, she, you know, when I smashed the door, I think she kind of, kind of grabbed hold of me Those conversations over the course of 16 hours were recorded with law enforcement and would soon come with controversy. Michael Sonic defended Owen at the time, and he went right after those interrogations. They were very aggressive. They stepped over the Constitution a little bit. Um, I think that, if I remember, it was the totality of the circumstances. You know, when you take a statement from someone, there are certain rules the police have to follow. But you also have to be reasonable. You have to give somebody time to think. You have to give somebody time to use the restroom, to eat. And they were just pounding, pounding, pounding at Mr. Owen. And, and the Supreme Court didn't like that. And it was a, it was a big decision in, in an effort to, to, to go after it. Violated Owen's right to remain silent during questioning. Owen's first trial and conviction for Karen Slattery's murder was thrown out. He would eventually be retried for her murder and found guilty and again sentenced to death. For the crime of first degree murder, the defendant is found and a judge to be guilty and sentenced to death. Investigators to this day contend nothing was done outside Owen's legal rights. These conversations were conversations initiated by Dwayne Owen because Dwayne Owen enjoyed talking about things that he had done and he liked the idea of matching wits, you know, with the investigators on the other side of the table. Uh, it was sport to him. And obviously, if he was going to talk, we were going to listen and that's kind of how it all played out. He reportedly told a cellmate where he hid the knife used to kill Slattery. After a lengthy search, a knife was recovered. To help prove the state's case, Slattery's body had to be exhumed from the grave. Experts wanted to determine if the knife was the murder weapon. Inside the courthouse in Owen's 1999 retrial sat Karen's family. They were forced to relive the pain and horror that unfolded some 15 years earlier. Inside that room was an additional burden, the absence of Karen's father, Eugene. Anybody that thinks that because they possibly live in a secure area or live a little bit above average in income, they're going to be above this, forget it. Eugene never got to see justice for Karen. He tragically passed away in a plane crash. That crash happened on Father's Day. 1989. Mr. Slattery was uh, was a very passionate man. Um, he, he loved and cared for his family and obviously he was uh, as driven as we were. My mom would go to the cemetery pretty much daily and she would go visit my dad and my sister. For Debbie Johnson, the retrial is where she learned what really happened the night her sister was killed. I know every single detail as to what happened. Um, more information than probably anybody should know. She was no longer that 10-year-old little girl. Of me on the balance beam. Instead, so a 24-year-old young woman reliving an agonizing pain. It brought back a lot of bad memories, and I think we can all sleep better at night knowing that he's He's going to be executed for what he did. I'm going through this all over again as if it just happened. And now I'm experiencing it as a 24 year old and not a 10 year old. And the only time that my mom and I and my brother left the courtroom was during the medical examiner testimony. My brother started, he couldn't finish, he left. And so my husband stayed and he said, that it was the worst testimony he had ever heard. 
but he felt compelled to sit there and listen because he wanted Karen to be represented. The support when Debbie needed it the most, never imagining what would happen 14 years after the retrial, another devastating loss. He was a good man. Debbie's husband, Brent Johnson, the pillar of strength for the family, would have his life end in a boating accident on Mother's Day in 2013. How do you do it after everything this family has been through? I go through life as a survivor and not a victim. Anybody could have crumbled under just one of the tragedies that I've been through or my mom has been through. My mom is one of the strongest women I know. I am going to constantly get up for as long as God will allow me, put my feet on the floor, and I will go to work, I will live my life, and hopefully make the world a little bit better of a, a place than it was the day before. Ahead, gone, but not forgotten. She's left a beautiful legacy behind. What this day of execution means for the families and the lasting impact this case will continue to have on South Florida. Bad things can happen to good people. Just like a storm brings change, so does this final chapter in a story that changed South Florida. Dwayne Owen took his final breath tonight. Family of Karen and Georgia were inside that room behind these prison walls. I've been talking to both families for months and they have different outlooks. How they feel about tonight's execution and what it means for the future. Right now, I want you to hear from Georgia's nephew and then Karen's little sister. Is this what the family wants? It's not something we're happy about and it's not something we're looking forward to. Nor do we think that it will provide any closure or relief or, you know, doesn't restore Georgia's life because it's been something that has been sitting with our family for almost 40 years. It, it's a thing that's been in the future as part of our family story for nearly 40 years. Um, and if there's, if there's work to do afterwards, we haven't been able to start that work yet. Is this what the family wants to happen? Yes, without a doubt, without a doubt. This is his sentence. This is what he was sentenced to. And our justice system says it needs to play out. And I will be there to represent her. I have to. If I didn't, I would never forgive myself. He looked into my sister's eyes when she died and I will look into his eyes when he dies. That's just it. As the sun sets on one chapter in this dark and difficult case, we turn the page on another. The inquiry and examination surrounding it will live on in the criminal lore of South Florida history. Like I say, it's one of those cases that not only do you investigate, but you live. And even when it's over with, uh, the recollections are still gonna be there. And uh, the memories, both good and bad, uh, will be there as well. As a society, we could gain so much more by studying them rather than sensationalizing their crimes um, and really try to understand how do we keep this from happening again. And the only way is to understand how did it, how did it come about. Well, this chapter ends. The pain for the families will never go away. And this is Karen. But the legacies of Karen and Georgia live on. For Georgia, that legacy lives on through her two daughters, Stephanie and Kara, both grown, successful women. I think that I would tell Georgia that she should be proud of her daughters. Georgia was one of the most fun people that my mom has ever had the, the opportunity to be around. I think she gave me strength through a lot of things. There was just something about her. She was just a strong personality for this little pipsqueak. I mean, that's just all I can say. She's this little tiny thing. But boy, the energy that she had and the pistol that she was, I, she gave everybody a lot of energy in life. And that's how her family and friends will remember her. Energetic, happy, and someone who would do anything for family. Did what happened with Karen lead to your career in law enforcement in any way? I think so. You know, when 
something happens and someone says, especially my job, well, I just lost somebody to homicide. I'm like, I can relate. There's a cardinal, just flew. For Debbie Johnson, her sister Karen comes to mind every time she sees a rainbow or a cardinal. Right after my husband had passed and we had lost um, Rick next door to cancer, we had three male cardinals and one female that would come and feed off of our bird feeders. And I just felt that that was them coming back to us. Karen's best friend says the memories come back when she hears the popular 80s song, Total Eclipse of the Heart. A crazy song, but that was like one of her favorites. Today, a tree stands tall in her honor at her former high school. Something that we planted while we were there in her memory, um, and it was a tiny, tiny little tree, and it has just grown so big. It is big and beautiful, and it just is like her legacy, like she, left us way too soon. She is like rooted in our in our lives. Karen was only 14 years old when she died. She never had the chance to get her license, go to college, or even get married and have a family of her own. Georgia never got to see her girls reach some of those same milestones. Both of their futures robbed by one man. I think it was very evident that bad things can happen to good people, and it doesn't matter. You're, nobody is safe. Nobody. Mm -hmm.